Yep. All right, so uh, welcome back. And why is there nothing on the screen? Uh, so, I've graded, I, I think, all the homework that everyone has sent me, except one email Sarah sent me, which, is, which I haven't graded, but everything else I've graded. So, um, if you send me some homework and it hasn't been graded, and it was before I sent you an email saying I've graded everything that everybody sent to me, then um, you should be worried and you should resend that homework or let me know. Um, I also intend sometime this week to send out an email with a summary of what I think your grades are. Um, because in the course of grading, of course, I have literally, from memory, copied and pasted, you know, and typed in hundreds and hundreds of numbers, and it's entirely possible I made one mistake or more. So you'll want to double check that the grade you got made sense, that the grades I think you have agree with the grades I sent you an email, etc. In fact, I find it unlikely that I didn't make at least one mistake. So. I recommend checking. So what I intend to send you is an email automatically generated, which will list each of the grades I have recorded for you, and then um, what grade you'll end up getting in the final in the course, given various grades on, say, your final project and your last homework as well. I'll just assume you're going to get a perfect grade on the last homework assignment, because all you have to do is turn in some draft of your project, and you get a perfect grade. So um, that should be easy to do. Um, but then for various grades on your final project, you'll see what you get in the course. So that will help you know what you um, want to do. Uh, let's see, what else? Also, as a reminder, one of your homework grades is dropped. So in case you missed one homework, that isn't going to hurt you. OK, I did turn on the screencast, I think. So that's one, two. Any general questions? OK. Um, I sent out a project list. This was mainly deduced from various people's homeworks. and. Uh, you should look at it. It's sent to the mailing list. So make sure your name is on there under one of the projects. And that if somebody else listed you as potentially being part of that project, you agree with that. Um, if you really want to help out on another project just for fun and you're not officially part of it, that's allowed. But, um, but uh, you should definitely take a look at that email that I sent out. And if anything looks funny to you, just send me an email and I'll fix it up and then send a new version out in a bit. And based on that list, I'm going to make a um, schedule. Currently, I think there are something like 29 different projects. And there are three classes. So with um, five minutes per quick lightning presentation, or lightning presentation is a term that was made up uh, by, from Python conferences, actually, um, then we can easily do all the presentations. Yeah, how do technically? I mean, uh, the typically, what I do is I start a timer on my uh, iPhone or something. That will automatically restart. It goes down five minutes, and then it gives you about a minute to switch over, and then it goes again. And if you have 10 presentations on a day, that's 10 times 6, which yeah. is 60 minutes. Um, I've done this like f six times before and never, ever ran out of time. Yeah, but uh, I mean, will there be a computer will be changing? That is, or, or op the optimal way is to have something you just give me. But in practice, some people have, every once in a while, somebody has a presentation where they really have to use their laptop. Most people just have something that's like on the public stage notebook server already. Um, but it depends on what you're doing or something that's just on the web. So you can, so mostly it'll be, say, my laptop, and you're just pointing to something that's already on the web. But um, in case you really need to use your own laptop, which could certainly make sense in some cases, then um, make sure I know that and um, we'll deal with that. OK? Um, all right. So. Our plan for this week is mainly to talk about graphics and then something else. The something else will likely be how to work with databases like SQLite in Sage. Um, and or more generally, really data, kind of databases and statistics go hand in hand. But I'll talk mainly about graphics. And today I'll talk mainly about 2D graphics. Um, one warning is I've been summoned for jury duty, and that could cause a hiccup. I'll find out tomorrow morning at 8 AM whether I actually have to go in. And then Wednesday, I'll find out if I have to serve, in which case I may have to have a substitute on Wednesday until however long jury duty can take, which is unknowable. Um, but how many people have, here have ever actually done jury duty? One? Out of the <laughs> Two. So I was 
summoned one or a couple times, but it's like I was always in the secondary or tertiary, ah. and it's like uh, it's never really ever had to go. So you've actually had to go? Wow. <laughs> so I guess the odds are low, given my sample. But I've never gone. I've, I mean, I've always just never, I call up and they're like, sorry, I don't need you. So tomorrow morning, hopefully, that's what we'll find out. Um, otherwise, on Wednesday, um, if I can't come in, then David, who's sitting right there, will teach for me. OK, so here's what's available regarding graphics in Sage. Um, by graphics, I mean drawing pictures and illustrations, which is very useful for pretty much every possible area of mathematics and data analysis and so on. So that's why, you know, if I had to choose one more topic to talk about in this course, graphics is definitely the one to do. Um, so what you have is lots of 2D plotting functionality, um, many, many functions for creating 2D plots. These were initially modeled on Mathematica's 2D plotting capabilities. Um, more precisely, Sage had no real 2D plotting capabilities, and I hired this um, guy who just graduated as an undergraduate, um, this, this surfer guy from San Diego, and uh, he wanted a project, and I suggested, okay, just go through the Mathematica documentation, change all the names and options so they make more Pythonic sense. So instead of capitals, camel caps and stuff, uh, make lowercase with underscores, and just implement all that plotting functionality so that a Mathematica user would feel comfortable using Sage to draw plots. And he just you know, sat down for months, and that's basically what he spent a lot of his time on. And it was an easy to describe project. It took me one sentence, and it got him to work. And um, that was the initial kind of, and it also makes sense because Sage is primarily, or at least initially, is primarily aimed at more math-like applications. Like you want to be able to type plot sine of x squared, and you don't have to mess with you know um, applying some function to an array or something funny like that, like you do in MATLAB. Um, and also, it wasn't necessary to write MATLAB-like plotting for Sage because Sage also has already inherited from the library matplotlib, and I've mentioned this very briefly before. Um, 2D plotting that is almost an exact clone of um, MATLAB's 2D plotting. There's a module called PyLab in Sage. You do import PyLab, PyLab.tab, and essentially any 2D plotting function you would ever see for MATLAB is there. And with it has the same options and they work in the same way. So it wasn't necessary to write something that was like MATLAB. It was already done. Um, and I'll talk some about that again, but I have mentioned that before. So that's where the 2D plotting came from. So he, you know, wrote a certain amount of, of code in um, several months during 2006, and then other people have uh, subsequently written all kinds of other code, and uh, some people realized that Sage was supposed to have a 2D plotting uh, system that was kind of like Mathematica's, a lot like Mathematica's, in fact. Um, and other people didn't realize that at all, and they just they didn't, you know, didn't know anything about Mathematica and thought Sage should have a function to do this, and so they wrote plotting functionality that you know, it's completely, um, it's just there, but it works completely differently than what you'd expect from Mathematica. So every once in a while, you have some funny things like that you have to watch out for. Um, in the course of preparing today's lecture, I think I found eight or nine things that I was unhappy with or which were bugs in Sage plotting. Um, and I wrote a long list of them in a thread to Sage develop. That said, there's usually workarounds, and the plotting capabilities are very powerful, and uh, so on. So there's 2D plotting, as mentioned here. And there's, again, 2D plotting that's like in MATLAB, in the PyLab module. There's also 3D plotting. It's mainly um, like Mathematica's 3D plotting, and it really does have quite a wide range of things. Of course, you can plot a function um, z equals f of x, y. You can um, plot a bunch of points in space. You can make polygons. You can draw arbitrary models given by triangles. You can um, consider a function f of x, y, z and plot the zero locus, f equals zero, and it will give you a nice sort of surface in three-dimensional space, et cetera, et cetera. So there's quite a lot of plotting capabilities. And for plotting, there's also different rendering methods. So you can render using a ray tracer that's included with Sage. So you'll have nice shadows, and the resulting image is a just a static image. You can render using um, JML, which is a Java-based renderer, and you can render using um, See, uh, there's Java. There's something called Java 3D. I don't know if anyone ever uses that anymore. Um, one of the final projects, maybe a year or two ago, the students rendered to some format that they could then print with a 3D printer, which they had access to at one of the um, probably the labs in maybe this building, sort of mechanical engineering building. Who knows? 
Um, but they actually brought in a bunch of 3D plots, like physical 3D plots that they made using Sage, which is kind of cool. So there's lots of different renders for 3D plotting. Moreover, um, Sage really being a Python library, in theory, anything that's available for Python, and there are many things that I didn't list up here that are available for Python, um, in theory, is also available for Sage. So for example, there's something called Chaco, which is a very dynamic, interactive 2D plotting um, library that was written by a guy at Nthought, that corporation in Texas. Um, there's Maya VI and VTK, which is used mainly for high-end medical imaging, that kind of stuff. So um, scientific imaging. So in theory, these could be installed into Sage. But in practice, it's hard. So you have to be highly motivated to actually do that. Um, OK, so that's what's available. Now what I plan to do today is give you a whirlwind tour of the 2D plotting in Sage that's more mathematical-like. Um, I'm not, I will talk a little bit about the MATLAB-ish version, but my guess is that if I just show you how to use it a little bit, many of you will already be familiar with MATLAB plotting, and it's like almost exactly the same. So there, I don't think I need to, to tell you how to use all of that. Um, but the Sage plotting, it's you know, sort of inspired by Mathematica, but it's not exactly the same. There are lots of subtleties and differences and so on. And, um, and so I, I really want to show you something. So basically, you can create graphics objects. They're just Python objects in all cases. These are the commands to create them. And I'm going to go through each of them in a moment. Um, if you create a graphics object, such as a plot of a function or an implicit plot of zeros of something or a bar chart, whatever it is, um, you can superimpose any number of these on top of each other by using the plus command. So if you have a circle and a triangle, you just add them together and you get them superimposed in some order. One will be on top of the other. And by default, it will seem somewhat random what the order is, but there is a way to control which goes on top of the other. You can also set an, um, a transparency option. If you want you know, your red triangle when uh, put below some blue circle, if you want, or sorry, put above a blue circle, if you want it to be kind of transparent, so the result looks like some combination of the two colors, there's an alpha blending option that you can give. So there's lots of things like that. So you can superimpose them using plus. Um, whenever you make a uh, scene which involves a whole bunch of different um, graphics, objects added together, you can render that scene as a PNG image. So it's just a static image, like a picture, and you can put that on your website, put it in any document imaginable, etc. Um, it doesn't look Beautiful in this, in, it will look reasonably good, but it doesn't work, look perfect because it's not a vector graphic. So you'll see like little bits of pixelization if you look really close, the fonts don't look perfect, etc. You can also render it as a PDF. Um, a PDF is much better because it really is a vector graphic. So it looks really, really perfect. Instead of, you know, a lot of like little jaggedy lines, you'll see it's perfectly smooth. And the fonts are, you know, you can scale them as much as you want and they stay looking correct. Those are even better for embedding in other um, documents. So if you're writing a paper or something, you definitely want to use, consider using PDF. <clears throat> you can render them as <coughs> SVGs, so scalable vector graphics. Um, these nowadays actually display in web browsers extremely well, and I'll show you some examples of that in a moment. Um, also, if you're going to take some graphics output from Sage and use it in a uh, vector drawing program, such as Inkscape or Adobe Illustrator or something, then SVG is the format you're very likely to want to use. Um, Basically, it's a, it looks like an XML format in plain text that describes exactly where all the points are and what their colors are and what the letters are and so on. And then EPS, EPS is embedded PostScript. So if you're an old school PostScript person from the 90s, uh, then that's what you'll want to use. Otherwise, you'll probably never use EPS. Um, there's also an animate command. Uh, if you have a whole bunch of graphics objects in a list, you can say animate of that list, and it will put them together into an animated GIF which is, again, a great format from the 90s, which is less popular these days. OK, so now I'm going to um, first just give you a quick couple of examples that show plus and rendering in different formats. And then I'm going to systematically show you each of these commands. So here what I have is um, I'm drawing the, a plot of the sine function where the input goes from 0 to 10. The color of the plot is red. The projector colors don't work so well. But, um, actually, if I make it really thick, maybe it'll be easier to see. 
this equals six. There. So that's a, a thick red line. Um, fill equals true. What that does is it makes it so that this is filled in. And I'm adding to that, so that it will be superimposed, a blue line. In Sage, a line isn't, it's really, if you give a list of, if you give two points, it's just the line that connects those two points. If you give a whole bunch of points, it's the um, sequence of lines that go through those points. So it's not necessarily a single line. Um, if you don't like that definition of line, just only ever give two points as the input. But otherwise, I mean, it's pretty useful. It's just a generalization. And um, all these plot functions uh, take very similar inputs. So you could give color as an input to line if you wanted to. And most um, words that you can think of for colors work fine. You can also put a hash and give an HTML color. So, if it's, so I can put like color equals like basically an RGB color. So if I wanted it to be green, I could go 00, zero FF, zero, 00. And then that should draw a green line, as you can see there. It's green on my screen. <laughs> it's really green. It's just this projector. It's terrible at colors. So um, yeah, it's really bad, this projector. It's green, see? I don't know if you can see here. See, that's green. It's going to make uh, today kind of funny, but... Uh, Hey, now it's green. <laughs> okay. All right. So that is green. <laughs> um, et cetera. So there's a bunch of standard options, and you can apply them to any of the plot commands. So thickness is another one. They may or may not make sense. There are a few things for which you know thickness doesn't make any sense. And then um, the result of doing this. So the result is this thing G which is a graphics object. It's just a certain Python class, and it knows about all the various elements that are inside of it. There are um, methods you can, or there are techniques you can use to get at each of the components of the graphics object. Yes? Yes. 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 So here's what happens. If you do plot uh, sign, say, I'll just do a really simple input like that. This is a function plot. And what it does is it returns a graphics object. So if I do it by itself, it does that. But this is a graphic, this object has the property that when you, if you just try to display it, not using the print command, but just saying, gee, if you just, just do it by itself, it actually displays itself by giving a graphic, as you can see here. An enormous image, unfortunately. That was one of my complaints, that the default output just got... In recent versions of Sage, it seems like the default output size for plots just takes up my entire screen. I mean, I have no idea why uh, it was changed to be like that. Um, but also, if you, if you just do that, it, it also just appears, as you can see. So that's kind of nice, um, except that it's so big. But you can uh, pass an option like this, and... Um, Basically, if, any, if you put fixed size equals into any of the components of the graphics object, it'll get carried on and then finally used when you display the graphics object. So that's why it's a bit smaller there. Um, you can also say print G, and instead of displaying it, it just um, prints something about itself. Okay? Does that make sense? So if you just do g all by itself, um, it's exactly the same as doing g.show. But the advantage of doing, actually, no, it, oh yeah, it is. The advantage of doing g.show, as I did here, is you can pass in various additional options, such as fig size. So let's say you want it to be you know, really wide, and you want it to be six inches wide and one inch tall. Then you can do that. Yes, you definitely could as well. So. It's another chance. It could be that, you know, the graphics object, uh, it's composed of a bunch of different things, and it's sort of a little bit um, ugly putting the fig size into, one, into the plot command. Or what if you had multiple fig sizes and various things here, and they were conflicting with each other, you're not even really sure what's going to happen. You could just do show and be absolutely certain. Also, show does have, I think, uh, I think it has some other options that you might want to pass in. So it has a bunch of stuff about the legends. Um, 
like the fonts that are used, whether there's shadows. I mean, there's all kinds of extra stuff here that I don't understand at all. Um, so, and other options that you might not think to pass in. Okay, so let me show you a few of the um, ways in which you can render a plot. So remember above we had this plot G, which is here. <coughs> so it's just this ridiculous looking thing. And now I'm going to show you various ways of rendering this. So one thing you can do is there's a dot save method on any graphics object. And you can give it as input. Um, first, the very first input has to be a file name. And based on the file name, it will save that um, file. So if it's a, it'll save that graphics object as a file. So <coughs> if you give it an extension that ends in PDF, it saves it as a PDF file, PNG, saves as a PNG file, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and then you can pass all the same additional options that you'd pass to show. For example, the fig size and so on. If you save it as a PDF or an EPS file, then you'll get a hyperlink to that file which you can then right click on, for example like this, and say save link as. And then it will download that file. And if you want, you can then click on it and whatever PDF viewer you have on your computer will pop up and show you that file as a PDF. This is a PDF, it's not some like goofy image that's embedded in a PDF or something stupid, it's genuine vector graphics. Notice that as I zoom in, that four stays pretty. It's not all pixelated or anything ridiculous like that. And the red line looks perfect and so on. Okay? So PDF is great. Anytime you're, it's a really good format. If you're writing, for example, a paper um, in LaTeX, then you can save your images as .pdf files, and then you can use um, include graphics and then give the name of the file. You have to use the uh, use, use package graphic X and then include graphics and give the name of the file. And then um, you also have to use PDF LaTeX, don't use LaTeX. If you want to use LaTeX instead of PDF LaTeX, um, for some weird reason, then you would use an EPS file instead. Um, okay. Uh, and to use an EPS <coughs> file, you can save like this. And that gives you an EPS file. If you try to view this on a Mac, at least, it'll immediately convert it to a PDF file and show you the PDF. So I won't even bother. Um, another thing you can do is use SVG. And here is um, how it works. You save the file. It doesn't give you a link to the SVG, unfortunately. Um, it's kind of annoying. It just displays the SVG embedded in the web page, which of course is nice because you get to see the SVG. And if you look really carefully, you'll see that this looks much, much better than the PNG that Sage produces by default. Um, just so you can see for comparison, I'll show you them next to each other. And by the way, you could do you can uh, save as a PNG. Anytime a uh, Sage command, where are the colors? Oh, this is because that was earlier today. Anytime, um, oh, there's one issue. You have to append a random number because a web browser, if it sees exactly the same image being pulled from the same URL image in terms of file name, it just caches it and doesn't actually grab it again. So if you're going to save as an SVG, currently you have to append some random number here. Otherwise, it won't get updated. That is, if you're saving it in the same cell. Um, it's annoying, but that's the way it is. In any case, if, if ever your um, code that you evaluate here produces a PNG image, instead of getting a little link, what you get is that the PNG image is displayed. So because this saved a PNG image, it just gets displayed right here. For a PNG image, that's fine. You can just click Save Image As. Um, somewhat annoyingly, if you try to right-click here, you'll just be able to Save As doesn't save the image, it seems to save the entire website or web page. So that's not very useful. Or give you an option to translate it to English. It's also not very useful because it is in English. I don't know what language Google thinks Sage is, um, I guess from Python. But in any case, um, if you look closely, I hope you believe the top one looks a little better. So for example, I don't know, that looks a little, maybe it's hard to see from where you are, but like that two looks kind of pixely and this two looks a lot cleaner. So generally speaking, the SVG looks a lot better. Um, but unfortunately, the only way I've found to save the SVG currently out of the browser is to like go into the developer tools, inspect this element, and then inside of there, there's a way to save it. Um, probably depends on the browser. But if you do inspect element, you get this kind of debugger, at least in Google Chrome. And then uh, you find the SVG file right there, and then you can click 
on that one somehow and save it. Maybe if you just click on it, that works, but it's, uh, there's what the SVG looks at, looks like, by the way. So it's, <coughs> it's basic, it's an XML format that describes the graphics. My opinion about the future of the notebook is that at some point in the not so distant future, let's say in two months, it should be the case uh -huh. that when you draw a plot, it by default displays as an SVG. And moreover, via some sort of JavaScript, when you click on it or there's a little menu or something that lets you download it, maybe any of the four formats. Um, so it's easy to get at the various versions of an image. Um, but currently, that's not the case. Uh, the main reason, we've had SVG rendering for about four years now. But uh, I remember trying this out in 2006 and 2007, and it was ridiculously slow. Like the second you rendered a single SVG in your web page, the entire web page was slow to a halt, and the fonts looked absolutely terrible, and like, I don't know, all kinds of weird uh, scroll bars would appear for no apparent reason. Um, you know, and it would be like, as you try to move up and down the page. And that was just with one simple graphic. But I just tried in three different web browsers today, and it's super snappy, and it seems to work very well. So I think um, SVG has improved in the last couple of years. See, that's a good sign. Well, SVG is getting there, yes. so, yeah. Okay. Intel browsers. But there's going to be a moment when SVG is the way to go. Because it, it really it does look cleaner. Like, that 0.5 looks so pixelated, and that 0.5 looks so clean. Maybe hard to tell, but when you zoom in it, like if I zoom in a lot, the PNG is just going to look more and more pixelated. Like, look at the, look at that. Are you going to press your mom with that? think so. But if you go up here, look at that. It's almost perfect. So clearly we want to be using uh, SVG. Okay, so next um, I'm going to tell you something that will hopefully avoid a lot of frustration. So let's suppose that you really, really, really want, and it may be hard to see this on the difference between what I'm showing you on the screen, so you just have to imagine um, just because the color. But suppose you really want that blue line to be underneath. You don't want it to be on top. Um, so in this picture, the line is on top, right? No question about that line's on top. I want the line to be underneath. I really want the line to be underneath. I'm really annoyed because I want the line to be underneath. OK, so here's <coughs> what I do. And just to avoid things changing, let me um, just take the exact code we used to produce this figure. And I'm just going to do what is probably the natural guess that you'd have for what you should do. Maybe, in fact, it should be the way things work, but it's not. I'm just going to switch the order of the drawing commands. OK, so I'll put line first. You figure that no matter what happened, probably putting the line first is going to be the way to make it be underneath, right? Seems reasonable. So, so now we try to show it like that. And let's see what happens. So it's sort of underneath. Half of it's underneath. It's underneath <laughs> this part, but it's not underneath the fill. So it's like really annoying. So you're just like, I mean, you're like, OK, it halfway worked. There's really nothing else to try. So it turns out, though, that there is something. There's, one, there's an option you can pass in called Z order. You pass in a number, and it determines the Z ordering, how far forward or back that entire graphics primitive is when the image is displayed. So again, just so that we're following the exact same example, I'm going to paste this in. And now I want the Z ordering of the line to be, whoops, I accidentally hit shift enter. So I want the Z ordering for the line to be negative. So it's in the back. And I want the Z ordering for the plot to be positive. Now let's see what that does. So now it's, so you'll, you still see the line, but notice that that yellow is a little more gray. The fill is, trans is somewhat transparent by default, so it did put it in the very back now. Okay, so you can control the order in which various graphics elements appear, and you'll want to do this very quickly if you start playing with plotting. You know, you'll like draw a line and you'll draw a bunch of dots, you know, where the line's connecting these dots together, and you'll get really annoyed because the dots are all underneath the line, but they should obviously be on top of the line. And you'll, be like, and you'll switch the order around and you'll be like, it didn't change anything. And you'll get really pissed. Just remember, use Z order. I don't know how many times I've been annoyed by this before Z order got added. 
the same way. Remember, one thing's from to Z order. Yes, I'm good. I don't know. Uh, does anybody know? If you have a similar command to determine the order in that not up there? Or not up? I don't know. Don't really care. But um, <laughs> it's a good question. It's a very good question. Uh, I don't use the systems when I can avoid it. Um, but yeah, uh, best thing to do would be to search for Z order space Mathematica in Google and see what happens. Um, I'll do that for you. Z order Mathematica. See what happens. Okay, and we get um, brings the control. Z bar doesn't really doesn't really suggest that it's called that. Hey, look, Math Four Eighty. <laughs> um, <laughs> Huh, of Documenta Mathematica, which is the best math journal, by the way, in my opinion, because it's completely free, and they let you keep copyright, and they publish really good quality articles. So if you don't know, if you're a grad student, you want to publish a research paper somewhere, I highly recommend Documenta Mathematica. It's funded by the German government, maybe. Um, so yeah, I don't see any, like, some command with exactly the same name in Mathematica, but I don't really know what to search for. Okay, um, Okay. some other quick things before we start the tour where I just show you all these functions, which of course may run into Wednesday given that time is elapsing. Yes, it does. Okay, so, um, all right, so frame and grid lines. Okay, so another really important thing is you can, um, you can, in your options to show, there are many, many, many options to show, maybe more than you'll ever want to look at, but some absolutely crucial options to show that you do want to know about are um, frame equals true. Basically what this does is switch from using an XY axis for your picture to having a frame around your picture. It gets rid of the XY axis and instead shows a frame. Uh, depending on what you're doing, an XY axis may be really annoying and silly compared to having a frame. Um, it depends. So the default in Sage, just like in Mathematica, is to draw an XY axis. And in fact, where the tick marks go in the xy axis was something that drove this uh, Alex, the student doing the work, absolutely crazy for months trying to emulate the Mathematica tick mark locations, just based on some crazy logic. But um, at least the the uh, axes things don't. I, I think now the logic isn't crazy anymore, but it used to be, and it would drive everybody crazy. So um, so yeah, this frame thing is important. So, so let me show you. It's just frame equals true. So first you create your graphics. And then if you say frame equals true and axis equals false, axis equals false turns off the xy axis, frame equals true turns on the frame. So that's often nicer for what you're doing. Just depends on what you're doing. Like it's really annoying if you, you, know, you draw an ellipse or a sphere or something, there's this big like, you know, crosshairs right in the middle of it. And you're like, I just want to see a sphere or I mean a, a circle. Um, there's also axis labels. That's really useful to know about because it's extremely common when you're drawing a plot to want to label the axis. And that's how you do it. Uh, what else? Uh, grid lines. So if you say grid lines equals true, it'll draw grid lines. And in fact, the grid lines function is ridiculously powerful. If you look at the help for show and look for grid in there, it's uh, much more than just grid lines equals true. There's, um, you, can, you can control sort of how often the grid lines appear, what the style of the grid lines are, and so on. There was uh, a Sage Days 9, which was mainly about graphics. Uh, one of the groups of grad students, their project was all about grid lines, and they just over-engineered it to death. So there's ridiculously sophisticated grid line stuff. Um, if you look down here, so, yeah, so this is all um, functionality that lets you have pretty powerful control over the actual grid lines, okay? So um, in case you want to have complicated grid lines, don't do what I used to do, which was just draw, draw a whole bunch of lines yourself by hand. You can use the grid lines stuff. So it's pretty powerful. The students in that project group at Sage Days 9, they implemented grid lines and then they also did um, adaptive refinement for the plotting command. So the plotting command also has pretty sophisticated adaptive refinement. What that means is when you do plot and you give a function as input, it chooses a bunch of random points, a certain number, maybe a hundred or whatever, 
and evaluates the function at those points. And then it looks for places where um, the slope appears to be somewhat big, and then it will adaptively add in additional points recursively to try to figure out what the shape of the function really looks like. Um, so that's another thing those students added. Okay, so now I've told you all the basic background and uh, kind of edge cases that will make it a lot easier to deal with plotting. And all that I have planned regarding 2D Sage style graphics is to just give you a tour in which I show you an example of each of the graphics functions. And I have 13 minutes, so I probably won't be able to finish all of these today, but we'll see. Um, there's a lot of them. Um, by the way, this link right here, which I put, is the section of the reference manual about 2D graphics. And as you can see, basically it gives you for every one of the plotting functions and has a section about that. Although I noticed that when you when you actually look at it, um, the examples can sometimes seem kind of odd. Since it's all auto-generated from the source code, they aren't necessarily what you'd really want to do. Um, so for example, there's an arc command. This is the way you would use arc, but because of how the code gets generated, you end up seeing this you know, import of the arc class and then creating an arc but printing it out. I mean, it's, okay, so it's, I mean, it's really weird. Note that the construction should be done using arc, and then it gives an example not using arc. <laughs> what? That's just weird. And then this is a good example that shows you know, how you'd really use arc, for example. So be somewhat cautious. But um, given the examples I'll show you, and typically if you just look at the help for a given function just by hitting tab after the open parentheses, you'll see pretty good examples that are really relevant to what you want to do. And um, in some cases, not in, not in all cases, but in quite a few cases, there'll be dozens of examples. Okay, so I'll just start showing you them. So arrow draws an arrow. Um, you give the beginning of the arrow and the end of the arrow, and it puts a little arrowhead on it, which is handy. And of course, you can adjust their options. Um, like, what if you want both head, I think both sides of the arrow to have points? So I think you can do head point and tail point. Um, but I think there's some option. Or maybe not. It doesn't seem to say there's any option. Um, there you are. Also, one thing is a lot of the plotting commands. If you give a if you give two points in 3D, instead of getting a two-dimensional arrow, you'll get a three-dimensional arrow. And I'm going to talk about 3D graphics later, but not today. Um, okay, so that's how you make an arrow. And again, what if okay, quick, what if you wanted to put ten arrows in the same scene? What would you do? Exactly. Just add them together. So you could do something like you can even do something like this. You can always add a graphics object uh, to zero, so you can go like this. Uh, I'll make ten random arrows just to illustrate that. Random, comma random. So what that does is uh, makes a random point, and then another ra random returns a number between zero and one uniformly, and that makes another random point. And let's see, control zero closes the or i in range 10. So that, that'll make 10 random arrows, add them all together, and show them. There you are. <laughs> and if I do uh, show fix size equals 4, it'll be easier to see. So there you are. And each time you run it, of course, it's different. And you can also, um, there's a lot of, all, many of the options that I showed you before for lines and plots, you can pass into arrows, such as the color. Um, there are many ways to specify the color, as I mentioned before. One is you can give a hue, and hue is a function that it takes in potentially more than one input, but if you just give it a number, it'll give you back a color. So, yeah. nice, pretty little picture there. And of course, you can do more than 10. Right. So, there you go. Books, so pick up sticks. Okay, so next. Um, Let's look at the ellipse command. So ellipse, you give it the center, and you give um, how wide it is and how tall it is. And you can give options such as its color if you want. And then you show it, and all this other stuff after show is just totally generic. I passed in aspect ratio equals 1, because my ellipse is, has width of 1 and height of 2. And if I didn't pass that in, maybe it would look like a circle. It just wouldn't look like an ellipse, or the ellipse that I want to see. So that's why I gave those options. Um, Maybe it would. I don't know, actually. There's some default for aspect ratio, which may be completely silly. Let's see. So it turns out that, in this case, it does default to having the right you know, one aspect ratio. But just in case you don't trust it, you can pass that in. 
Or if you want it to look kind of messed up, you could um, pass in a different aspect ratio, like two. And now, you know, it's, a, it's even more squished and tall than it would otherwise be. So you can control the aspect ratio. Um, I think I'll set that back to one. Okay, here's arc. So yet another function. Um, arc takes as input the center, which is 0, 0. And um, arc can, is general in that it can be like an ellipse. So you can give the, it's an arc of an ellipse. So you can give the, uh, how wide it is and how tall it is. And then you can give the angle. So that's how far it's going to trace out. Um, or actually angle's where it starts. And then sector gives how far it traces out, starting there. In other words, it's confusing, but you can give all the information necessary to trace out a little piece of an ellipse. And um, if you want to measure how long the arc length of the ellipse is, then I guess you'll be led to elliptic curves, um, which is my area of research. Okay. Um, here's something I complained about on the Sage development list today. There's a disk command, and it absolutely requires... So what it, the disk command draw, does is it draws a solid disk. But um, amusingly, it absolutely requires a third argument, which is um, where the angle starts and ends. So, you know, if you do, let's see, if you do that, you'll get you know, a piece of a, a disk. And um, my complaint is just that I think it shouldn't require the third argument. It should just give you a complete disk if you don't give the third argument. And if you want to give the third argument, that's a nice kind of extension of the idea of a disk. But it shouldn't be required. That seems silly. And in Mathematica, by the way, there is a disk command, and it doesn't require the third argument. Yes, Andre? I don't know. Uh, we can, let's see what it does. I think it should give an error, don't you? Maybe. I don't know. You think it should just allow it? Or maybe it should be extra dark? <laughs> okay. Yeah, it could change color. I don't know. You can do it with no warning or anything else. I don't know what it should do. What would you expect? Okay. Um, there's another option to disk. You can give whether or not you want the disk to be filled in. So here's a disk centered at 2 comma 3. Radius is 1. It goes from pi over 4 to pi over 3. It's not filled in. The line, in the di the line of the disk has thickness 2. And the size of the figure is 3. So. 0 to 2 pi. I don't know. Uh, we shall see. That's a good question. Nope. But. Hmm. It seems inconsistent, doesn't it? It's confusing. Um, if it's exactly the same as Mathematica, modulo not modulo requiring the third argument, then whatever. Um, I don't know that. So. Pac-Man. I hope yellow looks well. Yeah, yeah just tempting to... There. Okay. Moving on. Um, Here's the line command. I already mentioned that I showed it to you so much, but you just give um, a list of points and it draws lines connecting them. Okay, here's for fun. Um, I just took 2,000 points and I drew the sequence of lines that connect them. And I drew the lines very thin. The thickness doesn't have to be an integer. It can be any fraction. And I use the thickness of 0.1. So you get these really, really thin looking lines. And I drew the picture. Maybe one of the probabilist people in the room has something to say about what kind of picture you get in the limit. I don't know. It seems like there's some distribution here. Because there's a lot less darkness on the outside than in the middle if you do this. Is this the sort of thing probability people know about? Central, OK, in 2D? There's something about That's a great question. Oops. Oh. I guess uh, time has to be all in. I can do that. Time, 
is done with the, when you do time space, it uses the preparser, so it has to be on one line because it's not implemented well enough. But if you do percent time in a whole cell, it times the evaluation of the entire cell and shows you that it took 1.05 seconds. So it takes about a second. Um, I guess probably if we, probably that's going to take about 10 sec, 10 or 15 seconds. So it's that much longer. Yeah, yeah so it's actually it's only 2.4 seconds. So it's pretty fast. Less, less fun to look at, but if I do 0.04. So there you are. So it's pretty fast. A lot of the plotting is quite fast. Um, and uh, when we talk about things like implicit plot and uh, contour plot and stuff, when you're plotting, when the input to your plot is a symbolic expression, there's this compiler that Robert Bradshaw wrote that makes it super, super fast to evaluate the expression at an enormous number of points. Um, he basically sped up a lot of the plotting by a factor of a thousand or more. It's pretty impressive. Things used to be pretty bad. Okay, so, um, so there's that. And then points. So this is one thing to watch out for. Um, uh, so there's a point size argument to points. I have no idea what exactly what a point size is, but you just make it bigger and your point gets bigger. So whatever it is, uh, it's, everybody jokes about not knowing what it is exactly. Um, you can also, to the point command, you can give a whole bunch of points and it will plot them. It tends to be somewhat slow though if you have a large number of points. Um, but there's also a scatter plot command which gives you a lot more control and uh, you can, instead of a point, you can give like any of the map uh, lab style markers, like little triangles and squares and so on, and that's super fast for very large numbers of points. And I'll show you that later. So that's point. Here's the one, here's like the one way you can get yourself in trouble as far as speed goes. So I think this will be relatively slow. Uh, whoops, time. So what this is doing is it's making 2,000 separate points and then adding them all together and then rendering that. And the way it works behind the scenes is it really does somehow do something 2,000 times. And uh, it's, I, it could be fast, but the way it's implemented, it's definitely not optimal. So you can see that that took 13 seconds. Um, some clever programmer could change things and optimize this so it would be much faster. There's no fundamental reason for it to be slow, but it is. Um, so watch out. If you, if you add together you know, 2,000 separate graphics objects, it doesn't sort of put them all together into one uh, clean, fast format before rendering them, necessarily. Okay, so that's point. Um, text. So here's an example of some text. The command is text. You give us input a string. One really cool feature is you can um, put LaTeX in dollar signs inside of the string, and it will tech it. Um, there is an implementation of tech in Python in the matplotlib library. Somebody wrote, some Google Summer of Code student sat down and wrote an implementation of the tech formula parser. Um, so that's what's doing this. This is an interesting example where the SVG genuinely looks a lot better. Like compare that to this. So up there it's like an image and down there it's much better. So you can export it. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so we'll pick up with polygons and the rest of this worksheet on Wednesday, I hope, unless I am being a juror, in which case something will, somebody will do it. Yeah. So, um, I was wondering if you can you remind me your name? Kayla. Kayla. Okay, so I yeah. guessed it. Mm -hmm. um, you said like input doesn't work. Can oh yeah, yeah, it doesn't work at all. It'll just take forever. So that's when, you know, like when you're. Did you do the patch? Yeah. Ticket where you had to SSH. So the, yeah, it's when you SSH. Prompt? Yeah, the command prompt. That's what I mean okay, by the command so line. is that the only way you can do that? That's the only you know, way you can use the input you use function. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. yeah. Um, you can use interact, yeah. like the at interact decorator, but it's kind of different than input. Okay. So, I just wanted to make sure I knew. Yeah, yeah. that's what I meant. <laughs> okay. um, so for your project, you may very want, to, very well want to use the command line or yeah. that command prompt. Yeah. yeah. That's what the guy who did it last time did. Use the command prompt. So. Mm -hmm.